This is Vicki Crawford, and I am here interviewing Mr. Lonnie King. Today is Wednesday, September the 23rd, 2015. I'm in the Ray Charles Performing Arts Center on the campus of Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. We thank you so much for joining us, uh, Mr. King. It's my pleasure to be here at my alma mater. Well, let's first start talking about your background and your early childhood and what it was like growing up here in Georgia. Give us that picture and let's just start from there and begin. Well, I was born in Arlington, Georgia, a small town 27 miles southwest of Albany, <clears throat> Georgia. Came here when I was eight. Grew up in an um, alley on Capitol Avenue, totally segregated mm -hmm. in Atlanta, just like it was in Arlington, Georgia. Um, there were no rights that we had that, that the lowliest white child had to respect. You had to get back, move aside, you name it. Colored restrooms, this, that, and that. If there was any facility for you at all, if you traveled with your parents anywhere outside of Atlanta, you had to make sure that you could talk to people along the way who could make some accommodations available to you as you pass through. So some of those things were just a part of the overall milieu of what was going on at that time in terms of race relations. But Atlanta was no different from the smallest town in the South. It was a big town considered to be the capital of the South, so forth and so on. But um, whether, whether they were multimillionaires or poor whites, they had the same attitude about race. And so we want to talk about the era shortly after Reconstruction and the emergence of Jim Crow and laying the foundation for all of that. Talk a little bit about all well, that. Well, <clears throat> General Sherman came through and leveled Atlanta mm -hmm. around 1864, 63, 64. Um, and of course, that was the crucial battle that won the Civil War, in my view. Um, <clears throat> in 1865, after the war was over, 5,000 African-American slaves who were not ex-slaves were moved to Summerhill, and that's where they were confined over there. And I think one or two houses of that kind are still around over there. But they were ghettoized. As the population grew in the black community, where they then moved further over to something called Pittsburgh, and then later on into, into Mechanicsville. Then later on, around the turn of the century, they began to move uh, over into what's called Dogtown, which is the Auburn Avenue area. But Atlanta was always a pivotal city in race relations, not just during that period of time, but also today. But let me just give you an illustration of what I mean. In 1895, Booker Washington made this speech here at the Atlanta Exposition where he asked African Americans uh, to lay down your nets where you are, a roll of stone gathers no moss. Well, the genesis for that really came from the white farmers. They were upset because the black labor that was cheap labor began to leave the South in 1877 after Reconstruction ended and they started going to the Midwest. So in order to try to stem this tide, the white plantation owners convinced Booker Washington to make that speech, and he made it. Well, listening to that speech was an assistant professor at AU by the name of W.B. Du Bois. He was outraged because what it was talking about was having black people accept where they were and separate socially. So Booker Washington, uh, upset him. So then he wrote, by he, I mean, Du Bois wrote The Souls of Black Folks in 1903 to lay out the argument for the talented tenth and so forth and so on. And then in 1906, a major riot broke out, the biggest riot in the history of Atlanta between whites and blacks down the Peachtree Street and Decatur Street. Now you had some blacks who were very successful at that time in, in a separate society who had, who had built it, you know, who had, um, facilities, businesses on Peace Tree and Whitehall Street. The whites vandalized those places. They, um, I'm not sure how many people got really killed, but a lot of folks got beaten up. But it was a great riot of 1906. Du Bois uh, got him a gun and sat on his porch just in case they came in. So did a young man named John Wesley Dobbs because it, it was clear there was gonna be a real heavy race war. 
the blacks who were down on Peachtree Street and Whitehall Street, their businesses were forced to go down to Dogtown, Auburn Avenue area. And so that's why you had the big business area over there. But something came out of that 1906 riot that I think is instructive in terms of where we were in 1960. The powers that be, the Woodruffs, the Coca-Cola, and some other people around who were powerful whites, they decided that what we needed to do was to follow the pattern of a man named James Henry Hammond from Aiken, South Carolina, who really immortalized this idea of paternalistic leadership or paternalism. So they picked certain black people to be the spokesperson for the rest of the blacks, which is what they did during the slavery time. You know, they, they picked what they called the head nigger, and then you, only, you couldn't get to the boss except through him. Well, the same thing happened in Atlanta after, after 1906, and so they picked a number of uh, accomplished African Americans, and they dubbed them as the, quote, Negro leaders. And so by the time 1960 came, these folks were fully uh, enshrined, um, and if you wanted anything in the black community that the white community had to deal with, you had to go through them. And who were some of these people who were picked? Uh, some well, of the first person that was picked during that time was John Wesley Dobbs, who was about 25 years old. He was then a rising man with the Pullman Porters, working on the railroad and what have you. But he was also involved with the Elks. They also picked um, um, Peter James Bryant, who was the pastor of Wheat Street Baptist Church, uh, A.D. Williams, who was Martin King's grandfather, and Dr. Hugh Proctor, who was the pastor of the First Congregational Church at that time. Those men, plus two or three others, were the ones that were the middle people between the white community and the black community. But flashing forward to 1960, at the time we started this movement, these, these same people or some of their relatives were kind of in charge and understandably so now with 2020 hindsight, those people who were the picked, they were picked under a paternalistic system. They did the best they could do under the circumstances because if they went too far out of the traces, they would be hurt economically or physically. So we had founded the NACP in 1909 to begin to fight these cases legally on behalf of the class as well as the individual who filed. So everybody was kind of committed to a policy of gradualism. In other words, whites had to get accustomed to black people getting their rights one at a time, spaced out by 10, 15, 20 years. If we had continued that policy, we'd still be fighting battles through the courts and so some of us who were involved at that time were children of returning veterans from the World War II. And um, I'd have to just take a religious view on this and add in, let me just first of all say that uh, Victor Hugo, a uh, famous uh, writer, said, there's nothing on earth so powerful as an idea whose time has come. When you, when you put all these ingredients together, returning veterans who had children like me going to school, uh, veterans who had fought in the battle to make uh, freedom and, and victory for, for us a reality, but us being Americans a reality. And then when they came home, many of those veterans found themselves being relegated back into the same thing that was going on before they gave their lives, many of them, or before they shed their blood. But that was a repeat of what happened after World War I. W.B. Du Bois announced that we ought to go and fight in World War I because that would then give us a blank check that could be cashed when we came back from that war having shed our blood. We sent thousands of African American men over there to battle to save basically Europe <laughs> from the, the things that were going on. Uh, France gave out so many medals of honor, the highest award over there. Kid, our men came back and f some of them got lynched and beaten before they ever got home in their uniforms. So what, 
my point is, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much, it didn't matter how much we as a people contributed to the American ideal, the American family, the American creed that we hold these truths to be self-evident, all people. Are, there's always that little asterisk there in the minds of white America. And that was a part of what I think caused us as young people to realize, if not now, when, and if not us, who? Talk a little bit more about uh, the 1940s and okay. um, the years preceding your coming to Morehouse College. When you were, you, you came to college, I think, for a year, and then you went back yes. and got in the armed forces. Let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Well, <clears throat> when I was about 13, I was, I was playing table tennis at John Hope Elementary School. So I was a table tennis champion. But I'd always walk through the white gas field, which was right behind John Hope, in order to go down to the Buck Street YMCA. On this one particular day, I was leaving John Hope Elementary School, and I was walking through the field, and, uh, and a dog, the, the, the well, night watchman had uh, gotten him a dog. So the, so the dog, came out and started barking at me, acting like he wanted to bite me. And so I kicked at him. He, I didn't kick him, but I kicked at him. So this rotund white guy, whom I'd never seen before, said, nigga, don't you kick my dog. Don't you move. And, uh, and of course, at that time, if a white man told you to don't move, you didn't move. So I stood there. He came over and slapped me down because I, quote, kicked at his dog. But what could I do? 13 years old. Well, I got up and I went on down to the Y. So that night after uh, dark, I came back and I broke every window in that building. That was the rage that I felt at the unjust way that I had been treated. The statute of limitations has passed, so I'm sure nobody can get me about that now. But that was a violent act, but it was a violent act in reaction to very overt physical racism. By the time we came into bloom in 1960, I think that there had, there had been an accumulation of, of atrocities, injustices inflicted upon our people. And our folks, older people, wanted to do something about it, but they did it at their peril. Because you could be shot down, lynched. Even in Atlanta, you, I mean, you could be hurt. <clears throat> but when those four young boys sat down in Greensboro on the 1st of February, it was like lighting a match to kerosene or gasoline because <clears throat> I was one of a lot of young people who said, now is the time. And I must give you a little bit of off-color uh, analogy here. As I thought about <clears throat> what was happening in Greensboro, it reminded me of something that's somewhat indelicate. But if you go back and look at the history of that time, you will find that on some of your elite white college campuses, they used to have something called panty raids. And those, they would, they would go from campus to campus um, soliciting the underwear of the young ladies. And, they, and, and if, it, if it, it went to college A, and then it was read about it, and then college B, and it would take on after a while, thousands of young white African, I mean young white students were doing that, mostly men. So the idea was to really see could we not let Greensboro be by itself. And that's why on the 3rd or 4th of February, I got to my friend Joe Pierce and Julian Bond later on in that same day. Let's go, let's go do this thing. Let us not let this time pass. And many other folks, I think, had the same view because between February the 1st and June 30th, 70,000 African-American college students and some white students were ra raising holy heck about the, the lunch counter segregation. But it was more than just lunch counters. If you look at the, at the records, Atlanta, our students <coughs> published an appeal for human rights. That was the idea of Dr. Rufus Clement at AU. It was Dr. It was Dr. Clement's idea. Rosnell Pope named it, but it was Dr. Clement's idea, and he raised the money for it. But Rosalind said, we need to pitch our cause in, in not in civil rights, because we don't have any civil rights, but in human rights, aligned with the UN's uh, manifesto on human rights in the late 40s. And she was right. <coughs> so 
We didn't just talk about lunch counters. We set out an agenda. Restaurants, hospitals. hotels, hospitals, you name it. And if, you look, and if you're going to look at it, we followed that agenda. Um, and I think we were the most comprehensive movement uh, in the South that was run by students. I think the language of that, <coughs> uh, an appeal for human rights, is very, very telling, that you all were thinking very expansively from the, from the get-go, that you were not just thinking about rights associated with citizenship. Take us back to February 1st, 1960, and how, how the movement, how you all got organized. You talk about Julian Bond, name, name the names, and okay, where were you uh, yes. in Atlanta at that time? It was around the 3rd of February, I guess it was, and the Atlanta Constitution <clears throat> had an article about the four young boys sitting down in Greensboro. Well, I had breakfast almost every morning with a good friend, Julia, um, um, Joseph Pierce. Uh, he had gone through high school together and also gone through the Navy together and had come back to Morehouse. And so I, I said, Joe, look at this story about what's happening up in Greensboro. And he, you know, he, and he read it. I said, I think we ought to make that happen here. And I told him all about how if we could get enough students moving, we ought to be able to have enough agency to make this work. He agreed. I said, now, Joe, there's a guy over there that I met when I came back in 57. He's an English major. His name is Julian Bond. Uh, he was the intern for Time Magazine when he was in high school. If he, if he was an intern for Time in high school, and if he's an English major, he ought to be able to write. I said, now, what we're going to do, we need to have a scribe to write what we're doing. I don't have time to do it. You don't have time to do it. Let's, let's let him be the scribe, because I think he can do it. So, so let us go over and talk to him. <clears throat> Joe and I went over to talk to him, and Julian was reluctant. He said, yes, I had seen it. The implication, I think, that, that, he, that he must have gotten is that I thought, do, do, do you read the newspaper? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I talked to him, and uh, I said, Joe, I, I mean, Julian, I'd like to have you get with us on this. He said, well, I'm sure somebody will. I said, no, we need to do it. He said, oh, okay. And so then Joe Pierce, Julian Bond, and I started going all over the Yates and Milton drugstore, getting other students to agree. And, and we called a meeting in Sale Hall Annex for a few days later. And about 22, 23 people came to that meeting. Well, most of the people who came were Morehouse football players, to be honest with you, because I was a football player and uh, first string fullback, and I had a lot of support. But we also had Mr. James Felder, who was the president of the SGA at Clark College, at the time Clark College. We had one or two ladies from Spelman, I've forgotten their names. Um, Mr. Charles Black, who, who succeeded me as the head of uh, the Atlanta Student Movement, uh, and a number of other people. Rochelle Challoner? No, no, she was in, no, no, she wasn't, she didn't come back until August of that mm -hmm. year. Um, but that was the first meeting. Mm -hmm. Now later on, when the presidents heard about what we were doing, they called us down to their conference room um, to explain to us that we had to go back to school the class and let the rest of the people do this. And uh, they could tell that we weren't too pleased with that. But, the, but each one of them, beginning with Dr. Clement, asked us to go back to class and let the NACP do this. You ought to get your best education so that when you come out of here, you can help us in this struggle, but get your education first. Mays took the same position, indicating that he had talked to Roy Wilkins, who was the head of the NACP at the time, and Wilkins said that if you do things legal, lawsuits, we will pay all the money to keep it going. Manley took the same position. Dr. Brawley said that if we went downtown to sit in, we would embarrass him. But then <clears throat> Dr. Harry V. Richardson spoke up, the head of ITC, Interdenominational Theological Center. <clears throat> he waited about five, ten seconds before he spoke. He's a preacher. But when he spoke, he began by saying, I think the students are right. Shocked us because they had broken ranks in front of us. And he, he ran it down. His, his credentials, PhD, head of a university, spent his money in Richard's department, still in other places, but had to go find a colored restroom or a colored uh, whatever. On his heels came Dr. Frank Cunningham, the Morris Brown, who was the president over there. He said, I think Dr. Clement, I mean, Dr. Um, um, 
Richardson is right. I want to join him, and he supported it. But that by this time, we have the college president split. So Dr. Clement was talking to Mays as Cunningham was talking. And Clement said, well, who is going to speak for the students? And so everybody looked at me, since I was the major agitator. And so I started speaking. And I saw him and Mays conferring. And then when I finished speaking, that was when Clement said, I think you ought to write some kind of a manifesto to tell the public what you what, 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 what this is all about. And he mentioned that we were, we were the premier schools and all that kind of stuff. And that's when I appointed Rosalind Pope as the editor. Now I could appoint Julian, but I didn't want to run the risk of having, I'm from Morehouse, Julian's from Morehouse, Joe Pierce from Morehouse. We're talking about trying our best to have a, a solid, solid front spread out. And so Rosalind was my choice for, to write because she was an excellent writer. Julian worked with her, Charles Black, Morris Dillard, or Albert Brinson. We had to get back to the presidents to tell them, show them what we had done. The night before we were to present it to the presidents, Rosalind called and said, Lonnie, I haven't, got, I haven't been able to get anybody to help me. I said, what? She said, no. I said, Rosalind, write the damn thing. I said, we got a show tomorrow. And so, and so she did, she typed it. She had it typed, Julian typed it. Because Rosalind couldn't type, but she could write. And, but nobody had a typewriter except Dr. Howard Zinn. <laughs> and so Zinn agreed to let them produce it in his kitchen. And Julian did all the typing on it. And we had to, took it to the presidents and they were very, they were shocked at how well it was done. And Clement had raised $12,000 and we put it in all the papers and it was advertised as a full page ad in Atlanta Constitution Journal, the Atlanta Daily World. By the, way, by the way, the world demanded cash from Dr. Clement. The other people sent him a bill, but <laughs> they won't want cash. It was repeated in the New York Times full page, free, on the Christian, the, um, na the Nations magazine on this, mm -hmm. wrote it, reprinted it free, the uh, Hobbes and Crimson student paper, free, and the Jacob Javis, a senator from New York, had read into the congressional record, so it's there for posterity. And that document is still quoted a lot of places, 50 some years later. It's a later. remarkable document. Yeah. So tell us how the history of the Atlanta student movement sort of evolved after that appeal. That's when you really began to have a growing organization. Well, nine days later, it was, it was published on the 9th of March. On the 15th of March, which is six days later, uh, we started these demonstrations in about 11 different places downtown simultaneously. Now, I wanted us to have the demonstrations at 11 o'clock, between 11 and 12, because I wanted to hit the evening news. Uh, because by this time, TV had come to the South, and Atlanta was one of the major cities. But most of all, I wanted to put what was happening in Atlanta on the conscience of white America, not just white Atlanta. And the way to do it would be to get on, to the, on the evening news. So all of our demonstrations were between 11 and 12, sometimes maybe one, but always designed to hit the news. Um, there were about 200 and some people who participated on that first day. We had about 77 people arrested. Now initially we were, we were, we were following the policies that uh, the NACP wanted us to follow, which is to get arrested, get a test case, you name it. But there soon came a time when we realized that that was not gonna work. We had to go a little bit further than that because we saw other upper south cities moving and desegregating. So that's when we decided to have a big rally on, big march on, on May the 17th, 1960, in, in commemoration of the uh, Supreme Court decision in Brown. But then we also made a decision to have an economic boycott because we felt that Atlanta had so many rich people here who ran everything and they could hold out as long, much longer than folks could in Birmingham, Nashville, and other places because they had so much power. Coca-Cola Coca was one of the largest corporations in America at that time. And their net worth was approximately $500 million at that time. So, and they ran everything through Mr. Woodruff. So in order to bring about a change, you had to hurt them in their pocketbook. And I have to thank Dr. E.B. Williams uh, who taught me economics at Mohouse, and Dr. Hugo Scala, who taught me economics at AU, 
for understanding the economic system in such a way that we could then bring about a change. Um, I learned from my Mohawk professors that the that department stores operate on an 8 to 10 percent profit margin. It doesn't take a scientist to realize that if we were 33 percent of the population and we all had richest charge cards, if we could impact just half of that 33 percent, we're going to impact that 8 to 10 percent profit line. And that's, that was the basis upon which we organized to get not the rich blacks, but the least of us. And there were 97% of the black folks in Atlanta made under $3,000 a year. But when you put all that money together, it was a lot of money. And Richard's department store had made credit available freely to a lot of people. In fact, they, they put black folks got, they, they got courtesy titles in Atlanta from Richard's department store before anybody else ever did it. If you had a, if you had a, a charge account at Davidson's, Paxson, or some of the other places, you were a boy, you know, like John Lonnie King, whatever. Riches decided to call you Mr., Mrs., Miss, what have you. Now, that may sound like a small thing, but it was big at that time. So, therefore, if you talk about boycotting Richard's department store, you are talking about boycotting the most liberal place in town. But, if, but even though it was the most liberal place in town, it was good for business from that perspective. Uh, tell us about the Magnolia Room. The Magnolia Room was the, was the plushest restaurant in Atlanta, also probably in the South. It was their cream of the cream of the crop. And uh, we targeted that too, along with all the rest of the places down there. And of course, that really upset the folks at Richard's Department Store, that they were going to bring ourselves into their um, nice place. I remember when going there in June of 1960, when we started the boycott down there, I took Dr. Howard Zinn and his wife and his two children with me uh, down there that day, and they closed up the place when they saw me coming. And they had gotten all of the black folks who were waitresses there. They wore the, I guess you would say, the, the antebellum stuff, you know, the black uniforms with the little white. So they all got together and they, they folded their arms to block us from coming in. <laughs> well, the person who was speaking for them was someone that I had known for a long time. I won't call her name, um, but, but, but bottom line though is that she said, uh, Lonnie King, I know you, go home. And I said, Miss whatever, I won't give her a name. I said, would you please get out of the way and sit down. Uh, but we were not arrested. What happened is that Richard, Mr. Dick Richard, uh, had the chief of police to bring me down to the, chief, to the chief's office. And he was going to be there. So Richards came in to the meeting. And he read the riot act to me and told me that if I brought my black A back into his store again, he was going to put me under the jail, basically. And so I said, Mr. Rich, let me be very clear to you. I'm coming back in the fall. And when I come back, I'm bringing thousands with me. And he, at that, he jumped up, turned red, and walked out. And then Chief Jenkins had his folks bring me back down to Auburn Avenue, where our, where our headquarters were. Atlanta was not a city too busy to hate. They were hating all the time. But Atlanta, using the slogan of city not too, too, too busy to hate, was good for business. It, it, it was using positive propaganda from their perspective, or making it appear as though the environment was conducive for business, it wasn't as bad, we don't really lynch black people down here like they do in some other parts of the South. And I guess they were not re really lynching us like they used to do it in those small towns, but they were still killing our spirit, they were killing our humanity, they were stunting our growth. They had an anvil on our back, on our shoulders, in our pockets, weighing us down with this racism. Um, when you think about it, whites were making almost double the amount of money as black folks in 1960. I mean, as you know, co collectively. So uh, this was not the shining star city. or shining city on the hill. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was on the hill, but it wasn't shining when it came to race relations. Well, at the same time that uh, the students were organizing and getting started, Dr. King had moved back to Atlanta to co-pastor Ebenezer with his father. So about that same time, Dr. King comes back to town. You knew Dr. King. Uh, talk a little bit about that, and you knew his father, and you can really reflect on his 
you know, his leadership. And well, let me just tell you that Dr. King came back in December of 1959. And I have the minutes of a meeting where, Doc, where Daddy, the, the black leaders of that time used to have meetings and talk about what they were going to do in this paternalistic system. So at that meeting in December of 1959, chaired by A.T. Walden, uh, they raised the issue with Daddy King. They, they had heard that, that the son was coming back from Montgomery. And of course, Dr. King had become internationally known in Montgomery. They got Daddy King to agree that, that, that uh, his son would not get involved in Atlanta because we don't need him in Atlanta. We have our own leaders here. And so Daddy King agreed to that. So Dr. King came in in December, started preaching. Well, I had known them since 1945 when I was baptized at eight years of age by his daddy. So as we planned the fall campaign in 1960, um, we wanted to use Richards as the main point, but all of downtown, but Richards was the kingpin. That was the year that we had presidential debates for the first time, 1960. So as I looked at those debates, there was never a mention of the fact that the racial situation was roiling all over the South. Nixon didn't talk about it. Kennedy didn't talk about it. It was all foreign policy and domestic policy, but nothing about the, the ex-slaves and their, and their descendants um, and what they were doing. So in trying to plan for October the 19th, we scheduled the 19th of October, two weeks before the election, um, I called Dr. King Jr. and asked him if he would join us um, on October the 19th at 10 o'clock, and he told me that he would, and I explained to him why. And so we kept uh, moving, planning, realizing that we had that. When the students came back, I presented the plan to the executive committee, the, 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 three from each school plus me, and um, A.D. King, and Bernard Lee, who had come in from, from Alabama State, I had asked that I, they had come over to the meeting. I was saying, let's do it on October the 19th. A.D. and Bernard were leading, along with Elroy Emery, a charge saying, let's do it now. Let, let, let's do it. I said, no, 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 no. So the Spellman lady saved me. Um, <clears throat> that was when Herschel had come back to take Marion Wright's place and Rosalind Pope's place. Uh, along with Norma June Wilson. So the Spellman contingent, all three ladies joined us at Morehouse and also the ITC people joined. So bottom line is that we won that battle, make it October the 19th rather than immediately. So we began to organize and what have you. So on the night before we were supposed to go, I said, uh, Herschel, give, uh, uh, give Dr. King, ML, Dr. King a call, and here's the number. Tell him that everything is on for 10 o'clock tomorrow. Meet me on the bridge. The bridge would be the, the small restaurant between, um, Richards had two stores there. They had one, the headquarters was on Broad Street, but then there was a viaduct that you could go over to the store for store homes. homes. So there was a little eating place called the bridge up there. So I told him to meet me there. So she came back a few minutes later and she said, he said he can't go. I said, what? He said, no, he, 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 he just can't go. There's something, something has happened. So I said, Hershey, I'll talk to the students because I was talk while I go talk to him. When I got there, he, on the phone was Dr. King Jr., Dr. King Sr., Y.T. Walker. Uh, A.D. was there for some reason. A.D. was there too. But I didn't talk to any, any one of them. I talked to Dr. King. And as I listened to him tell me that he had been arrested um, with Lillian Smith, so forth and so on, he was on probation, had a four-month sentence, all that kind of stuff. I said to him, Dr. King, oh, no, I said, ML, Atlanta's your hometown. Now, I didn't know about this other deal. I learned that later about in 1959, don't get involved. I said, but we need to have you go with us. And I thought about a sermon that his daddy used to preach all the time. You can't leave from the back. You got to leave from the front. And so I said, ML, you can't leave from the back. 
you got to lead from the front. And he said, LC, I, I was called LC at that time. Where, where, should I, where should I meet you? I said, on the bridge, 10 o'clock in the morning. And he was there. But the result of King going to jail was exactly what we predicted. It became international news. Um, <clears throat> the Kennedy people got involved um, because Harris Wofford, who was the assistant to King and to Kennedy, to the two Kennedys, called Mrs. King to express their condolences and then Bobby Kennedy got involved. He was very angry with Harris for it because they didn't want to lose the South mm -hmm. because Governor Vandiver was the campaign manager for the state, for Kennedy. And so the, all these delicate things were going on. So Wofford got involved and then he called Mrs. King. Bobby Kennedy got very upset about that but, and fired Wofford to be honest with you, okay, he fired him. Uh, but then Wofford got Sergeant Shriver to get to John Kennedy, who was his brother-in-law, to convince him to call Mrs. King. And, and King did do that. I mean, so Wofford, um, Kennedy did do that and uh, expressed his condolences Robert to her. Kennedy. No, JFK. JFK called her. And uh, that, all, that got publicized all over the place. But once JFK made the decision to make the call, then Bobby had to back back because Bobby was the campaign manager, but he was not the candidate. So once that happened, they reinstated <laughs> Dr. Wofford. They put together something called the Blue Bomb. And they sent out 11 million copies of the Blue Bomb, which talked about King going to jail in Atlanta, at Richards, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to, I'll get you a copy of the Blue Bomb. But that 11, those 11 million flyers went all over the black community in America to all those churches. Now Nixon was leading Kennedy two weeks before the election by double digits. Because black people have been voting Republican ever since Abraham Lincoln time in the 1860s, except for Roosevelt and Truman. So they were, they were ready to vote again for the Republicans. But once the King thing was used by the Kennedys, black people switched all over America and voted for Kennedy. And he carried 70% of the vote in the black community. And that's what made Kennedy president. It was the black vote and King going to jail. But there was one thing that was a little strange. Every black community in America voted for Kennedy except Atlanta. John Calhoun from Atlanta, Republican strategist, brilliant organizer, kept the town in the, in the, the Nixon column. But all the rest of the country went for Kennedy. And African Americans in America are still voting Democrat since 1960. Well, talk a little bit more about Dr. King and uh, his and Morehouse College. Okay. Uh, and what you what you learned at Morehouse through Dr. Mays, uh, the presidency of Dr. Mays. He was president from 1940 to 67. So when you were here, he would. Yes. Been. What What was he? What What were the teachings? What What was the influence of Mays on you and on King? Dr. Mays spoke most of almost every month. He spoke on a Tuesday. And he was basically indoctrinating, I guess, the men to be leaders, to be the very best that you can. And so I, and you had to go to chapel, mandatory. If you didn't go, you'd lose some hours. So he was the principal person in terms of philosophy that I listened to at Morehouse for those years that I was there. Um, Dr. Mays would say things like, a Morehouse man never, never sacrifices a principle for peace. Um, he always had some well-prepared, inspirational message for those descendants of ex-slaves, men who were sitting there talking. Um, he made us have a sense of pride that we could do it. A Morehouse man could do it. I remember him saying in the same speech, he said, um, if you decide to be a doctor, be the best doctor, be the best dentist, be the best teacher, best lawyer. But then he said, but if it's your fate in life to be a ditch digger, 
be the best ditch digger God ever made. Those kind of things made a whole lot of difference for me. Professors at Morehouse who had a lot to do with my, um, I guess you say, upbringing and teaching was Dr. E.B. Williams who taught me economics. Uh, and I learned the economic system of, of the world through him and through Dr. Hugo Scala. Another person who was very instrumental on me was, was, was Dr. Gladstone Chandler, who taught me uh, English and humanities. <clears throat> Another one was Dr. Samuel Williams, who taught me indirectly philosophy. And I say indirectly because all of the football players had decided that we were going to duck Dr. Williams and we were going to take the class classes, the two, psycho two uh, philosophy classes from Dr. Cunningham in the summer. <laughs> and lo and behold, we all showed up, about 25 of us, for, for these two classes back to back. And Dr. Cunningham got sick. That was, a big that was the beginning of his demise. And lo and behold, that Monday morning, in walks Dr. Samuel W. Williams. <laughs> and he walked in and said, you thought you were going to get rid of me, didn't you? And he had, we had a wonderful time, but the man was brilliant. He, he, talked, he taught us logic. He taught us about um, how you put together rational arguments. Um, but so there were a lot of folks there. Dean Brazil, in his, in his own way, was also a very, very instrumental person. He did not have the maze finesse but he had a lot of common sense, and he was highly educated, but just did not have Mays' presence. Um, but he had some interesting things that I think many of us remember to this day. Well, let's go back to pick up where we left off with the movement and student activism. Let's go back to the period now around 1964, 1965. Uh, you got very involved and active and um, some boycotts, that, that'll be before that time, boycotts of stores and you were over in 61 boycotts. In the West End mm -hmm. and um, I think it was a boycott of a, was it a grocery store? Man, it was Man Brothers Grocery yeah, Store, let, that let, was 1960, that was 1960 I believe it was. Talk about it? that a little bit. Well, um, we were trying to desegregate, integrate, whatever you want to call it, uh, the grocery stores because the grocery stores that were serving the black community were all owned by whites. And they had a white cashier. Everybody who was in the grocery store working and who was counting the money was white. Black folks had to be the janitors and the maids and the stock clerks. We didn't think that was fair. And since, since we talked about jobs in the appeal, we decided to target AMP, Alaska and Pacific, Colonial stores. They were chain, these were chain stores. We also decided to hit Man Brothers. Uh, which was on what was then Gordon Street. <clears throat> so as we announced that we were going to come over there, there was a paper, I think it was called the West End Star, who wrote an editorial on the front page in red letters. And they urged the white population in West End to come out and run that nigger Lonnie King, the Hitler. They call, he called me a Hitler in red um, out, of, out from here. So I went, Charles Black was there and Frank Holloway, the three of us, with our picket signs. And about 300 whites across the street calling us all kinds of names, jeering, you name it. We weren't sure, but we were close to maybe having a riot over there. Well, there was a white man who was standing there by the door, and we kept passing him. He had his hand in his pocket. And I thought, well, I wonder if it's a gun or what is it, because he was just standing there looking at me as we came by. So finally, after passing him maybe four or five times, he, he took his hand out of his pocket. And it wasn't a gun, but it was, but it was, a, it was, a, it was a flask of, of a liquid something it ended up being something like acid because he, he doused it on me. And uh, I had on glasses and so, shades, and so I, it didn't get in my eyes, but it was so powerful until I never had that kind of pain before. It, it, it uh, ate into my face, ate up my shirt, ate up part of my pants, and um, totally blinded me. Charles Black was right behind me. It was so strong it got him too, but he, but he and Frank Holloway continued picketing. 
A guy named Ronald Yancey was passing by who went to Moore House, later on went to Georgia Tech. He stopped his car, grabbed me, and said, Lon, I know you can't see. Let's go to this service station over here and let's get some water on you. So I, I stumbled behind him to the service station. They refused to let us get any water. They didn't care. That's just a nigga who's got some, he deserved it. So there was another service station down the street. He said, Lonnie, let's go to the other one. So he's, he's holding me up. We get down there and he appeals to the other guy. And these are all white people who run this service station now. And he agreed to let me get some water to try to relieve the burning and the pain. I guess in about 10 minutes, in comes the police, Dr. Captain Little, who was in charge of all the folks dealing with us. He came in and they put me in the car and took me to Grady Hospital. But they took me the kissing way to Grady Hospital. Instead of going straight to Grady Hospital, they drove the speed limit and went, and went, and went, went out toward West End, went out um, <clears throat> that street um, that takes you over to, um, what's the name of the street? Greensfield? No, they were not Greensfield, but they also went all the way over and went down to Simpson Street, all around there. It, it took about 35, 40 minutes driving the speed limit to get down there because of all the out of the way places that they went. But that was designed to really teach me a lesson because they knew I was in pain. So when, I, when we got down there to the emergency room, the color of the emergency room, um, they took me in and they took my shirt off and they started working on me. So he said, well, I'll, we'll take the shirt for evidence. That's the police. And so I gave it to them. When I got out, I called a little back to say, can I have that shirt? Oh, we destroyed it. In other words, they took the evidence because they didn't want me to have the evidence to support what they had done. And, I, and I'm almost convinced that the police knew all of this was going to happen before it happened. Striking parallels between some of what we're hearing about today with all these incidents with police brutality and what's happening in the jails and what was going on then behind closed doors in terms of how black people get treated. I'm glad you asked that question. Mm -hmm. A certain class of white men have always been the enforcers of the status quo, that is whites on top, blacks on the bottom in America. During slavery time, it was something called the slave patrol. Uh, they were men on horseback who went around, primarily rounding up black men, because it was mostly black men who escaped, it wasn't black women, some of them did of course, but women didn't leave because they had children. The men could go on and follow the North Star. So they'd round them up and they, they, they had a charge to either bring them back dead or alive. And so they would go and they'd find us. But after slavery ended, a lot of these people joined the Ku Klux Klan uh, out of Pulaski, Tennessee, 1867. They then lynched approximately 5,000 African-American men between 1867 and about 1910. Georgia was number two. Number one was Mississippi. And Georgia was close on the heels. I mean, like several hundred. None of those white men who did this were ever punished. Then about 1920, at the, the country became more urban than rural. That means then that you're going to have police forces in these, little, in these towns. A lot of those people who had been the descendants of the Klan, who lynched all those people, all of a sudden became police persons. And they put on blue uniforms, got a badge, got a knife stick, got a gun, and kept killing black men. And that thing has not stopped, even to this day, even at this moment as you and I are talking. But going back to Morehouse College, I took statistics over there. And one of the things that I learned was about the bell curve, the standard deviation. And my recollection, it's been a long time since I was in school, but my recollection though is that if you have instances between one and 30, you won't have a bell curve. It's possible that all 30, all 30 could be positive or negative in the first 30. When you go to 31 and up, 
You're going to get a bell curve at some point. So many are going to be positive, so many are going to be negative, so forth and so on. So therefore, let's take that same analogy, if it is true in terms of statistical information. How could you have these thousands of black boys being shot by the police and every one of those policemen, 99% of them are white, would be exonerated? That is statistically impossible unless you're cooking the books. So that brings us kind of down to now to talk about, uh, for you to reflect on all that you and your generation did, did um, in terms of uh, the black freedom movement in the 60s and how far we've come now. I'd like to hear you comment on looking back and looking forward, you know, what's your assessment of the goals of, of what you were doing? I'll be very happy to talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, in 1960, well, first of all, we have been taught to be tolerant, to be forgiven, um, by and by, things will work out. We, we risk our lives in the 1960s to change a system. I promise you that if we had not done that, the thousands of us who got involved, we would still be segregated. The South was, and other, they weren't prepared to take down segregations. To have a two-tiered system was fine with them. And they didn't care whether or not anybody in the rest of the world liked it or not liked it. This was their home. They stole it from the Indians and therefore they were going to keep it. Having said that, we fought and we got down the signs, we got the voting rights thing changed, we put an affirmative action, on and on and on. Fair housing. But let's flash forward now from the 1960s, 50 years. We knew that we, we, hadn't, we didn't have full freedom in the 1960s, but we were on the pathway to get it. What we did not know was that while we put our drive toward freedom, going down the Freedom Highway, on, we, we put it on cruise control because we, we changed the law. So let's let folks get accustomed to us being, having some rights. The folks who were opposed to us, that we were battling, put their effort to stop us into overdrive. Mm -hmm. And so we're cruising along, but these folks are speeding up here, so they changed affirmative action. They, they finally gutted the Voting Rights Act. They stacked the Supreme Court. They switched over from being a segregationist Democratic Party to a segregationist Republican Party and changed the name to, quote, conservative. As a, ways, as a means of trying to, con trying to hide what they really are doing. I am very distressed because I'm one of those folks who risked my life to try to bring about a change. And lo and behold, I look up here 50 years later and we have to fight some of the same battles all over again. This time with the people who were there with me but who were white, they're now in positions all over the place. And I, I always thought America was a very, very racist country, but I did not realize until I've been, I began to reflect on the last 50 years, this is the most racist country ever known to man. The most racist. They bought into this two-tiered society beginning when they first brought us over here in 1619, designed to build this country with free labor so they could have more money for the 1%. That policy has not changed. They have been very consistent. Now, what they did though was that they used positive propaganda. This is the land of the free, the home of the brave, et cetera. Bring, me, bring all your tides, what have you, and, and those people yearning to be free. That's all baloney. What they really meant was Europeans first, beginning with the British, the French, the Germans, and they grudgingly agreed to let the Italians after the 1920s be, become white, and they didn't let Jews become white until John Kennedy became president. And, and you know the rest of that. But because of our color, we would never be viewed as being white. 
Now, the glass is not half empty. It is about half full because we have been able to get some people who don't look like us to realize that there's something wrong with this picture. I mean, how can we have this creed of where we profess one thing, but we do something else? And the, the leading proponents of that idea are not white men, but white women. Because white women see that this white man will do them just as bad as they're doing black folks. This isn't the first time that white women saw that, by the way. If you go back and look at the, the idea of abolition, 100,000 white women were the shot troops in that movement. Now, Frederick Douglass and, some, and Garrison and others got all the credit for it, but those white women were the shot troops that helped bring about the abolition. And we fell out with them, or should I say, Mr. Mr. Douglass made a bad decision on the uh, 15th Amendment to the Constitution, wherein they left women out as being covered. And the women got mad and formed their own thing, and they got their own rights and by 1920. And black women were nowhere in that. There you go. Home. There you go. There you go. Absolutely not. There you go. So what would you tell young people today? I mean, given what you just said about the harsh reality of where this country is and how invested we are in race and classism and, and, and all these uh, structural forms of inequality, what, what are we telling our young people? I'd like to say to the young people coming after us is that we've got to go back to the drawing board and you've got to get a generation of people who are willing to say uh, what we said in the 1960s. If not now, when, and if not us, who? We have still some of the tools necessary to bring about a, a better and just society. One of them is the fact that we can go out and register some voters. Georgia has approximately one million African Americans who have not been to jail, who are not registered. Georgia is red today, as is most of the South, because of the non-feasance of people who say voting doesn't matter. They have been sold this notion that it doesn't do any good for you, for you to vote, we're gonna still be in charge. That's a lie. Atlanta, Georgia would still have white mayors if we had not registered voters and started to let people, to vo people vote. People these are the Republicans who are so right-wing against us in this Southland and in this country. They are, they are in there because we as a people have refused to go out and exercise our right to vote and then go out to register and then vote. The population of today, here's what I would recommend. It was not easy to end segregation. It had to, it had to come through organization we had to get the masses involved. You've got to sit down and organize across state lines with a common agenda. You've got to use economic power of the black community as well as voting power. If you could register those voters and get them to come out, you could change the state overnight. You could change the South overnight. It doesn't take long, but it takes hard work. And it also takes or in reorientation, because a lot of people who look like me think it's hopeless, it's helpless. The other thing I would say is this. We've got to also turn the camera on ourselves. We have 70% of our young babies who are being born outside of wedlock, and the dad has disappeared. We've got to find some kind of way to begin to change that. And I think that the black church and other black institutions ought to get involved it's one thing to say I want a $65 million plane to fly all over the world, uh, but we need to have $65 million worth of effort on the part of the leadership as well as the fellowship to help us make liberty, freedom, and justice ring for us. And the most important thing we have not done is that we have not taken advantage of all the laws that are made on the books for us to get us out of slavery. What about in the area of education? It seems to me there's, there's one area where the disparities are so great that, um, you know, it's, it's almost akin to a time well, let me, well, let me just mention this to you. I think that the church has a role to play in this. We have over a thousand churches that are black churches in this state. 
I don't know how many of them are involved in the education of the children in their communities. Oftentimes, parents who are only involved as long as their children are in school, but then when, it's, when the child graduates, then they become, they move on. But because we are the underclass, we will never be able to overcome all these obstacles until, unless we, until we blend together and work together. Uh, I'm making a men's, a men's Day speech at a church here soon. And one of the charges that I'm going to bring forward is for, is for the men to rise up, men of God, and get involved in the lives of these young African-American boys. And I'm going to mention to them historically, um, it was John Locke who said, what you teach a child from the time that child is born until that child is uh, six years of age will pretty, pretty much determine where that child is going to come out in life. John Dewey said something similar to that. But we've got a lot of young African-American boys who are on their way to the penitentiary as opposed to on their way to the penthouse. And a lot of that is because there's no male figure around oftentimes. Or, and, or the mother's on a job that's not paying much. She's got to keep running from job to job. And so the children are, raise, are raising themselves. The church used to take an active role in the community, not just for its membership, but for other people too. And, I'm, and I think black preachers, African-American preachers, ought to begin to turn their sights toward liberation. We have the delusion of being free. We are not free. What do you think about the role of the public school system though? You know, you see in large urban areas that there are just great discrepancies in terms of public schools. But I'm saying that. You know, and the pull out of white pull out from public schools to charter schools and all these other kinds of. Well, what I think about that is that the black men, the black community, needs to get involved in the education of these children. That's why I said between the first, between one and six, once your children graduate from school, you just kind of, I'm through with it. But we're all inextricably tied together, whether we like it or not. We have a common destiny, common perils. The educational system is not going to get any better for us until we demand that it be better. And that means then that you've got to go to some PTA meetings. You've got to, even though I don't have any children going to this school, I have some people who look like me going to this school who are young. Therefore, I say that you need to get involved with the schools um, also. Uh, let's talk a minute about the election of uh, the presidency of uh, Barack Obama, first African-American president, elected two terms. What's your thinking about him and what he's done since he's been in office? Barack Obama was, a, was the realization of the dream of a lot of people who are now dead, and some of us who, may still be, who are still here. Um, I am extremely pleased with what, doc, with, with what he's done. He's had to pull this country as a leader on his back and was on his back and was in the way of racism. And even with all that stuff on his back, he's like a lot of black folks. They do superhuman things. Obama is the, be the only record that may very well be better than Obama's in the last hundred years. Would possibly be Franklin Delano yeah. Roosevelt and possibly um, Truman. But Obama didn't have it eight years. Roosevelt had 12. Um, this man, when you put his accomplishments together, he brought us back from not a recession, but a Great Depression. And what nobody wants to talk about on the Republican side is why did Obama have to face all that kind of turmoil? Because George Bush bankrupted the darn thing, this, this, this country, messed up the Middle East. Because when George Bush came into office, George Bush the son, we had a surplus that Bill Clinton had left. But the surplus went down the drain in that ill-fated war. George Bush's daddy had the right idea. Don't go to Baghdad, come on out of there. But no, George Bush, the junior wanted to retaliate against the Iranians because they caught somebody, I think Saddam Hussein allegedly put a hunt contract on his daddy. 
We don't know whether that's true or not. But all of a sudden, we end up seeing people cooking the books, lying, chanting all the rest of them. And they wrecked this economy. The Republicans won't mention that. They, they try to pretend like the problems that Obama started to deal with in 2008 just all of a sudden didn't start until he got there. The man had to stop this country from going down the drain by himself almost. He's shown the power of the presidency. Uh, and they just cannot stand it. But you know why? Because it goes against the conventional narrative that their granddaddies and their great granddaddies had, which was passed on to them. There's something wrong with this picture. We've got to take our country back. How in the world did this man from Kenya uh, end up being the president of these United States? There's something wrong with the picture. We've got to change it. And they use negative propaganda. Let me say something to you. If any more house men see this and others, I want to recommend that you do something. Go to um, your um, computer and type in anti-Negro propaganda or anti-black propaganda and look at how many pictures pop up, almost all of them black. There will be hundreds and hundreds of these there. That will give you, just looking at those images, what kind of country you are living in. And those images were not put there by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution or the Birmingham World or the Miami Herald. Those images were fostered by MGM, Fox, 20th Century, um, Warner Brothers, the major media outlets of the time. So therefore, go and take a good look at what's going on. Uh, if there's anything Morehouse men need to do is to be leaders. And leaders are people who go and study what needs to be done in order for their people to be free. We have a continuing struggle. But the main thing I want to leave is that we are inescapably tied together, men and women, because we have a common birth in terms of heritage, and we have a common destiny, but we can change that destiny that white people have for us, for us exercising the kinds of rights and liberties and privileges that other people died in order for us to have. Okay. I want to thank you, Mr. Lonnie King. Um, great concluding remarks. Uh, we could go on and on for another hour, but I want to thank you for coming here on the campus of Morehouse College to speak with us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me.